We continue probing today into when God doesn't answer prayer. My friend Steve Mosley tells the story of his involvement in an evangelistic series in Japan that just wasn't working. No matter how hard they prayed, people were not responding. Later, they discovered that two of the student missionaries were having a sexual relationship. The missionaries. Well, we read scriptures yesterday pointing out that persistent disobedience definitely prevents God from answering our prayers. The Bible specifically warns that God cannot bless disobedience. Well, there's another time God doesn't answer. He simply won't answer the prayers of those who are unmerciful toward others. Look back with me in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 13. If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. Listen to Isaiah chapter 1 verses 15 to 17. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Now, by the way, this applies within the marriage relationship. Those who are inconsiderate and disrespectful to their spouse cannot expect God to answer their prayers. 1 Peter 3, verse 7, Likewise, husbands, honor the wife, that your prayers be not hindered. But sometimes prayer is not answered. James chapter 4, verse 3 reveals, Because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Other times we receive no answer because, well, because we lack faith. Look at James 1, verse 16. Wow, you say. But hey, nobody's perfect. And you are right. God does not expect perfection in those who pray, but he does require humble penitence for past failings and integrity of purpose for the future. But here's another clue when God doesn't answer prayer. Prayer may be ineffectual because it is feeble, listless, and inconstant. Sometimes we don't get what we want because we don't really want it very badly. Charles Spurgeon compared prayer to the pulling of a rope to ring a large church bell. Some pull so feebly they hardly stir the bell. Others give only a, an occasional jerk. Only rhythmic and vigorous tugging of the rope rings the bell loudly enough to move the hand of God. I like that. Intensity of desire, it's essential. It is only the fervent, energetic prayer of a righteous man that avails, James 5.16 says. Oh, and Matthew says in Matthew 11, verse 12, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. The violence here meant is a holy earnestness, such as Jacob manifested as Ellen White says in her book, That I May Know Him, page 272. You see, listless Laodiceans, their prayers do not prevail with God. Still, many apparently faultless prayers remain unanswered. There was no lack of intensity on the part of my good friend Sandy Wyman Johnson. When her seven-year-old son Trevor was diagnosed with an incurable brainstem glioma, she begged, she sweet-talked, she cried, she bargained with God. He's only seven. 
I interviewed Sandy for a Voice of Prophecy radio broadcast. And some of you have heard her testimony on the Voice of Prophecy family reunion musical videos. Wrenching, stunning. Her heart choked with tears. She said, you know, what was going on in my heart was that I was trying to set up God's agenda for him. I remember talking to the Lord and I said, look, look, Lord, if ever the stage was set for you to be glorified, this is it. I mean, this is always a fatal condition. The glory would be given totally to you. The doctors could certainly not take credit for healing this condition that is always fatal. So many people are praying, Lord. Wouldn't it be an incredible testimony to your power and your love to heal my little boy? Sandy said to me, Lonnie, I tell you, the more that we all seemed to pray, and the more people that we heard were praying, and the more fervent, and I believe faith-filled were our prayers, the quicker he deteriorated. The drive from her home to Santa Maria to the hospital in Santa Barbara was one and a half hours, and she drove it both ways about every three days. She said, I would spend that drive praying out loud and crying. A couple of times I had to pull off to the side of the road because my eyes didn't have windshield wipers on them. But as Sandy spent that time, Sandy's prayers began to change from telling God what she wanted him to do to the prayer that, well, whatever you do and whatever you allow, Lord, it'll be okay with me because I know that I'm either going to have disappointment with you or I'm going to have disappointment without you. I don't want to be without my son. But if I'm going to believe that you are who you say you are, and that you always operate out of love, then something very loving is going on here. Though it hurts like crazy, I have to choose whether I'm going to keep trusting you or not. Sandy said, and when I did that, I had great peace about it. I cried about the reality of what appeared to be inevitable but I had great peace about it. Sandy says, so often in prayer, we take a card and fill it out with our agenda and give it to God to sign, when in fact, what we should do is sign it and give it to God to fill out. The last night, one of the nurses said, Sandy, would you like to hold him? And they put him in my lap and for about a half hour I just held him. It was just very difficult to watch your child fade away and get to breathing just a few times a minute. But I can tell you that the most ironic thing in that time was that I had never felt God's presence so close in my life than I did holding my son while he was dying. I can hardly finish telling you what Sandy said as she closed her interview. She said, when it says that our faith cannot be shaken, I think the only faith that cannot be shaken is the faith that comes from having already been shaken. I think that God answered our prayers and is answering our prayers. No, it was not the answer that we felt that we wanted. And yet miracles occurred all around us and are occurring all around us, even now with people's hearts being moved by Trevor's experience. She said it's uncanny how one little seven-year-old boy could touch the hearts of so many thousands of people that he never knew. Someone much bigger than me is sprinkling magic dust across the country by Trevor's experience. Sandy said, I don't think you can explain that in any natural dimension. 
I think there's something very supernatural that's going on. Well, Sandy put her story in a book, Hold Me, Help Me, Heal Me. See, God has assured us that if we ask for bread, he won't give us stones. But maybe asking for bread and getting stones is not our problem. We are far more likely to ask for stones at the time we fancy them to be gemstones and God, in his mercy, gives us bread instead. Take Gus, for example. Gus was a man of the world. He was articulate, vain, arrogant. He had a brilliant mind, and he didn't want to waste it on religion. He gave free rein to the lusts of the flesh. Gus went for all the gusto he could get, used his finely honed mind to turn others away from God. But Gus had not been raised that way. His mother had sung hymns to him as she nursed him. For years, her tear-stained prayers for him had stormed the gates of heaven with no evidence that God was listening. In fact, one day Gus told his mother he was leaving town and going to the big city to pursue his career in public speaking. Well, this is what his mother had feared more than anything else. She knew that her son would probably lose himself in the frantic pursuit of pleasure there and never return to the faith of his family. Fleeing to the church, Gus's mother fell on her knees and begged God to keep her son away from the big city. She had never prayed so hard in her life. But when the ship sailed for Rome, Gus was on it, and his mother was heartbroken. Now, it just so happened that there was a famous preacher in Rome by the name of Ambrose, and a friend of Gus's said, you gotta hear this guy. So Gus went. Ambrose was perhaps the only preacher of his day who could have reached that brilliant young mind. But one day, young Gus, Augustine, heard the voice of God calling him to read Scripture, and he opened to Romans chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, nor in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Giving his heart to God, Gus Augustine. Augustine became one of the great leaders of the Christian church. People call him Saint Augustine to this day. Carl Johnson of Kankakee, Illinois had a son too. His country called Kenny to service over there in Vietnam. While his son fought fierce battles on the ground, Carl waged spiritual battles for him in another realm, praying daily for Kenny's safety. He asked that his son be brought safely home. One day after months of agonizing prayer, the answer came. Carl heard the audible voice of God, like Philip back there in Acts 8.26, saying to him, Your son is safe. I'm protecting him. Peace took the place of Carl's fears. After that, he never prayed for his son's safety again. Two days later, as Carl drove home, he saw a number of cars parked around his home and his dreams crumbled into dust around his feet. His wife met him at the door. Kenny was killed in action, she said. He died for a country he loved and a cause in which he believed. Just two days ago, you told me he would safely return home. Now he is dead. I always believed in you. What happened? 
Well, Carl was speechless. And the voice of God had been so vivid. Unable to understand it, he asked God to help him interpret his experience. Then he remembered when Kenny had been killed. It was about the time that God had spoken to him. Finally, Carl found peace again. God had not given him what he wanted. He had given him something far better. Your son is safe. I'm protecting him. Carl had asked temporal security for his son. God gave him eternal security. Now the Bible gives reasons we sometimes do not receive an answer to our prayers. Sometimes the problem is sin in our life, wrong motives, and so on. But other times God gives us more than we ask for, and we interpret it as less. We want a million dollars. God gives us a true friend. Guess which is more valuable? We want a human friend. God offers us intimacy with himself. We want an easy way out of trouble. God grants us a difficult initiation into the next higher circle of spiritual maturity. Remember, it worked this way even with Jesus. In Gethsemane, Jesus asked the Father to release him from the unspeakable horror of the cross. But God had something better in mind for him, the undying love of all the redeemed, all power in heaven and earth, endless praise, crowns within crowns, the eternal adoration of the angels, glory beyond, ima beyond imagining. But in order to give Jesus that, God his Father couldn't release him from the shame. You see, Kenny Johnson, Trevor Johnson, from a human standpoint, well, God lost the luggage. Or did he? Fortunately, because God said no to Jesus, no to Kenny and Trevor, they have the brightest possible future. So often says Trev Trevor's mother, Sandy, in prayer, we take a card and fill it out with our agenda and give it to God to sign, when in fact what we should do is sign it and give it to God to fill out. You see, friend, when life looks darkest and the dark chasm of defeat opens up before you, just remember, things are not as they seem. Your disappointment may be God's appointment. Pain will continue to happen and human nature will continue to shrink from it, even as Christ's human nature did. But God is good. And he will give us something better than we want for ourselves. The sooner we can learn to pray Francois Fenelon's prayer of total submission to God's will, the better. Lord, I don't know what I ought to ask of you. Only know you know what I need. So I open my heart to you. Behold my needs, which I don't know myself. Smite or heal, depress me or raise me up. I adore all of your purposes without knowing them. I am silent. I yield myself to thee. I would have no other desire than to accomplish your will. Teach me to pray. Pray yourself in me. Amen.